Welcome back to Veronica Live, and we are off to our next guest, Drew Allen. He has his new show on the Patriot TV, which the show is literally outstanding. I watched the the first show, Drew, and I loved it, and he's also the author of America's Last Stand, and um, everybody needs to tune into the Drew Allen show, but welcome back, Drew. You're my favorite millennial of truth. Well, you're my favorite something or other, too. <laughs> well, I looked it up this morning because I go, John, what am I? Because I'm not a boomer. And yeah. <laughs> um, I figured out I'm actually Generation X. So that sounds really cool. So I had to look it up because I knew you were coming on the show. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, anyways, the first show was, you know, because you've always had your podcast, which is amazing. But I loved the show because, you know, you're playing all these clips and you had Dr. Carol Lieberman on, which I wanted to start there first with the State of the Union because it was it was just absolutely atrocious. And um, and plus the man was high and you had Dr. Lieberman confirm that. Mm. So we'll take some Adderall over here. But go ahead, Drew, with your thoughts on the State of the Union. Well, yeah, I mean, just kind of simply to summarize, I mean, maybe a lot of people listening watched it. If you didn't, you didn't miss anything. Uh, Although, you know, what you did miss was the worst State of the Union address ever given that I've seen or heard by President of the United States, which maybe that's not surprising because this is also the worst president in American history. So it's befitting of him that he would deliver such a poor address. But it was a campaign address. It was divisive. Uh, it, it has no place. I mean, really, he desecrated. I mean, look, I mean, think about Nancy Pelosi when Trump was in there. Remember, she ripped his State of the Union address in half uh, symbolically. Um, and then you have him giving this address. And I'm tired of being gaslit. I mean, the Democrat Party really is. And Rhinos, too. But as a party, the Democrat Party is the um, most serious lethal threat to this country um, that we faced. And they're gaslighting us all day about MAGA being a threat and Trump being a threat. But, you know, the the only thing that people really need to see, the only thing that will be remembered from that State of the Union address really is him calling Lake and Riley Lincoln Riley and then acknowledging that she was murdered by an illegal and also downplaying it, saying, you know, well, how many people are killed by illegals? And so the big thing about that was um, the left and the media were not upset that he confused Lake and Riley, the murdered uh, Georgia, you know, nursing student, 22 years old, with Lincoln Riley, the head coach of the USC football team, they were upset that he used the word illegal to refer to the illegal who murdered her. And he went on an apology tour um, oh my gosh. afterwards. He went on TV and he apologized for using the word illegal. He said that illegals <clears throat> built this country and he said that he's not going to um, uh, uh, not insult. I forgot the exact word, but he, he regret calling to, the uh, migrants an illegal. And you know what? He wasn't an illegal. He was a freaking murderer. So I, I, I mean, it was yeah. the 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 craziest soundbite. Every time I have you on, Drew, I'm like, we can't even make this stuff up anymore. I mean, it's like we're living in in a horrible Hollywood Netflix movie. Oh, well, well, it's insane. I mean, I had I had a piece out <clears throat> at American Greatness that came out um, yesterday on Friday, and the title of the piece was uh, The United States is Not the World's Trash Can. And oh, it was the, excellent. The was saying, yes, that was so good about the Haitians. Yeah, yeah, Haitians and then everyone else. I mean, my point is, if you think about what, what Biden did after he, he got attacked by the left for calling the murderer an illegal, which he was— uh, he said um, that he wasn't going to uh, – I just had the word and I forgot it again. But um, uh, anyway, disrespect is the word. He, he, he's not going to mm, disrespect mm-hmm. uh, even criminal illegal murderers, but he has no problem disrespecting American citizens. He has no problem disrespecting the Supreme Court. He has no problem disrespecting anyone who thinks differently than he does. And if you think about um, the border situation – We have been kind of um, psychologically attacked on this issue because the purpose of immigration isn't to help the world. 
The purpose of immigration is to improve the United States of America. And if you listen to Joe Biden, the Democrats, you know, they they will have no problem, Veronica, robbing all of us of our hard earned money and then to give it to illegals who broke the law to house them, feed them, clothe them while while telling us that we didn't build the country and that illegals built the country. I've never seen such uh, illogic, such treason is the real word for it. I mean, you're not elected president uh, of Haiti. You're not elected president of El Salvador. You're elected president of the United States of America. And your job isn't to help the world's poor. The United States is not the world's rehab. We are not the world's homeless shelter. We are a Ferrari, and they treat us like that junk car, the Serbian Yugo, that's just can be disrespected however you want because it's a piece of crap. And the American people in some way have, have bought into this idea that it's our responsibility to take in the basically discards from the rest of the, the world. Those people they don't want, whether they're poor, uneducated, or murderers like this person from Venezuela that killed Lake and Riley. So we really need to change our thinking, too, and have some self-respect and look at America and say we're the crown jewel of civilization. Illegals don't get to come here because they just – want to uh they get to come here because we want them to and they don't get to tell us you know what are you going to do for me we get to say how are you going to make this country better well your your question in your op-ed is why are we having all these people from i'll just say shiza holes countries coming here you know and it's true why why and and now haiti is an absolute it's in an upheaval, and and yeah, actually, big, DeSantis is protecting is Florida. Florida. Like yeah. you know, I, I, you know, he doesn't want these people here. I, I feel for the Haitians, but I mean, I think it was in your op-ed you talk about all the other places they could go besides America, and there's a lot. There's a lot of other countries they could go, and everybody has to land here. And and my problem is the doors wide open, and you know, besides. Lake and Riley, how many people have been killed? I mean, this the last two weeks, there's it's been so lot. many people raped and killed and hit by somebody, you know, that's drunk. And it's just literally out of control. Well, and well, what do you expect when, when you get like Maduro, you know, and down there du- emptying his jails and sending them all up here? You know, I mean, we're getting all, you know, all these crap people up here, not not model citizens. That's right. The United States is the world's penal colony, right? We accept the criminals from all around the world. They just come here, and uh, we let them kill our own citizens instead. It's unbelievable. We're just a prison for El Salvador. Well, I thought the State of the Union was not good. And then, you know, we had the female Alabama Senator Britt. That was the first time. I didn't even know who she was. And I, I like the verbiage of her speech, but it was very over-the-top, dramatic, like she was in some theatrical performance. And, and it's already hard for women to do TV and these kind of things because people always go after you because they were mad she was in her kitchen, you know, and that she looked so pretty. And then it was very theatrical. <laughs> so that, I, that I part want... didn't help. And then I heard her on Clay and Buck yesterday because, you know, uh, Scarlett Johansson played her on SNL, and so now her head's exploded because this hot actress, you know, that all the men fawn over has played her. So, uh, again, we're defeating what the point was. I, I want to know why Donald Trump didn't give the Republican response. I, I would have I mean, loved that. Would've, that would have been a real hit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it didn't make sense because there were a lot of people that could have given the rebuttal that should have. I mean, maybe, for example, some of his VP options. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. It's only been two weeks and I'm still coughing. But anyway, no. um, you know, uh, so many people could have given the address and it would have been tremendous. And they went with her. And I mean, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist. I mean, part of me looks at this. I, I do know Republicans sabotage themselves, the rhinos. But I just think, how did someone decide to go with her? And I'm not attacking her personally. Honestly, right, I know nothing right. about her. She well, could be she could be wonderful. I mean, the but, verbiage but she was did, good. She didn't. Yeah, sure. But the, but the delivery was pathetic. It was humiliating, right. to be honest. Yeah. I mean, she made us a joke. And um, that's just that's objective. And, you know, we could have looked. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not going to blow it out of proportion because it doesn't matter. It's going to be forgotten. But that's the problem, because we had an opportunity to do something memorable that would have actually done some damage to the left. And instead, we inflicted a little bit of damage to ourselves. Again, 
it's not uh, some kind of mortal damage. It's it's not that big of a deal in the in the, in the grand scheme. But given the stakes of everything, this this the, you know we can't miss opportunities like that. And she um, she did a terrible job. That's just the reality. She wasn't ready. So, so what do you what do you make it? You know, Republicans. It just amazes me how they they keep shooting themselves in the foot and their capacity to to shoot even bigger guns at their <laughs> what's left of their foot is amazing. But you know, this week we had Ken Buck quit. You know, and and you know, you McCarthy out out from your area, he quit. You know, so we we have these Republicans. We're down to like one a majority of one now, I think. You know, after they booted Santos out, and Santos and, is and, looking pretty good because I heard him on a space this week. So yeah, I have and, to and, say, and what I what I heard was some rumor that there may be two or three more Republicans that quit before the end of the year and basically hand control of the House to the Democrats, which which just it's astonishing. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to believe that there are actually people that are elected to represent the Republican Party that actually are siding with the Democrats who are radical Marxists that are destroying the country. Um, it's it's not just selfish, it's evil. And um, Ken Buck, look, I mean, what Ken Buck's doing, um, yes, it's selfish. Uh, yes, he's an a-hole. Yes, he's a piece of crap, actually, in my opinion. Uh, he he was elected. Firstly, he was elected by you know people in Colorado to 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 represent them, and he can't make it until November because look, he already announced. I mean, I, I, we got to get into a little bit here because I want people to understand something. He announced that he was not going to run for reelection um, come November, and so what happened was people might remember Lauren Boebert caused a little bit of a ruckus when she decided that she was going to switch districts. Yes. Because she only won her district by like 600 votes. So the district that she was announced she would run in was Buck's district. So he said he's not going to run. She said, that's a safe one. That's Republican plus 8, 10, 12, 13. So I'll, I'll run over there. Now, think about politics and who's attracted to this business. A bunch of uh, awful people that are self-centered. And so she made a lot of people mad when she did that because there were people – and there were there were people that are, are rhinos, for example, that the Republican Party in Colorado were planning to run in that seat. Right. And she took that away from them. So they're mad about this. So this is about a little bit of personal revenge, I think. So anyway, so what's happening now? So he's leaving like this coming week, I think. It's just like abrupt. He's out of there. And so there's another. Yes. Yeah, so we lose another seat in the House. So. um they're going to have to have a special election to temporarily fill his seats just until November. So Lauren Boebert cannot run in that special election unless she wants to cause damage to the Republican Party further in the House because she has to vacate her seat if she runs for that special election. And that special election is happening like June 25th or something like right, that. Right, right. And it's very confusing because voters are going to have to vote for someone to fill the seat temporarily – and then they're going to have to vote in the primary the same day, which is Lauren Boebert, a different person. So they have done all kinds of damage to the Republican Party right now by Buck doing what he did. And I think part of it is an F you to Lauren Boebert, and then also part of it is an F you to the country. So it's those two things going on, but it's crazy. Wow. Well, it's just, it, it's disheartening. And what do you think about when um – President Biden, like, addressed the Supreme Court justices. I, if I were them, I would never show up again, honestly. Well, I think, I mean, it's horrendous what he did. I mean, he, that's what I say when he's debased and defiled the State of the Union and the Office of the Presidency. I mean, you don't behave that way, but that's not surprising because this is the same guy that acknowledged that with his eviction moratorium. No Supreme Court justice would agree with it. He said it wouldn't pass constitutional muster. It was illegal for him to do so. But he said, screw it. I'm going to do it anyway, even though I know it's not constitutional, because by the time it gets to the court, I will have been able to do a little damage. And so he doesn't respect the Supreme Court at all. But what's worse is, you know, most of those justices, especially the left-leaning ones, they didn't care. They don't care that that he did that to them. I mean, obviously, you know, he was talking about Roe v. Wade, so he was talking about the conservative justices, but – I mean, it's just unbelievable the the lack of respect he has for this country. And, I mean, people have to remember, the president of the United States, I mean, it's like a symbolic role 
as well. So how you conduct yourself um, has a lot of influence because it reflects on the country as a whole just by virtue of you being the president. And it shows that, you know, this government has no respect for the rule of law in America. And um, it contributes a lot to our unraveling as a nation. Well, um, I I read a I read a a piece there about about the history there. And and the Supreme Court is over over the history of time has not attended state of union because they are a third branch of the government and they read the Constitution. The Constitution says the president shall inform the Congress, not not the judicial branch, the Congress. And they said, we're not part of this. You know, that's not our deal. And it's only a fairly recent thing. And I think uh, who Clarence Thomas, Justice Thomas, refuses to go and, and will not go. to Ale- the- Alito doesn't show up. Alito doesn't go. Right. right. Well, I, I wanted yeah. to ask you, too. Yes. You know, the Fannie Willis just got her hand slapped. So she, so she just has to break ties with her lover now. And she got her and, slapped. You know? Yeah, and she's still <laughs> worth $8 million, true. Uh, so I wanted, I just couldn't believe this judge, now that I'm a check, you know, a certified check mark on X, I like to put my tweets out there. And, and I wrote one about the judge saying, you know, this is how you want to be remembered in history with this? I mean, what an embarrassment. Well, it just shows how deep the rot is in our justice system, how how um, how corrupt it all has become under Democrats. So Judge McAfee, the one who was tasked with deciding whether or not to disqualify Fonnie Willis, he is he donated to her campaign. He uh, in the past actually worked under her and he's a Democrat himself and he's up for reelection himself soon uh, for that seat for, you know, to be a judge again. Uh, so, you know, it's no surprising that you put somebody who is a, you know, um, uh, activist in charge of making the decision. But, you know, what he did was an embarrassment. Um, obviously, uh, this is like what we've seen with James Comey exonerating Hillary Clinton. Mm-hmm. And most recently with Robert Herr um, saying oh that gosh. he wasn't recommending charges against Joe Biden. All of these people are corrupt. Robert Herr's corrupt as well. And all these people, their jobs were, okay, look, we know these people committed crimes. We know they're in the wrong. It's, it's not deniable. So how are we going to make an excuse and justify getting them off the hook? And McAfee um, just did the same thing. And it shows that um, the, the Democrats have stacked the deck so much in their favor in terms of appointing all these different people or getting them into offices and judgeships and so on and so forth that it's very difficult. I mean, how many layers do you have to peel back before we can find justice in America? Well, I think if I'm ever arrested, I'm going to say I'm, I'm a I'm a new convert to the Democrat <laughs> side. <laughs> yep. uh, yeah, because that yeah, hair, the her, yeah, yeah, the hurt. <laughs> The her <laughs> testimonial stuff was, you know, so yeah, so so Fanny gets a pass and Biden gets a pass and we never get a pass. And then the, the story that bothered me the most, and, and this is the headline from the AP News, in a first VP Harris visits Minnesota abortion clinic to blast a moral restriction. So she says immoral. And uh, and then they, you know, they have a quote from the proud abortion doctor. Uh, I mean, I, I know that this is their number one, you know, platform fighting for women's health care. But now you're at an abortion clinic advocating for the killing of babies. Uh, Drew, I can't even take it anymore. No, it just shows that there's no evil they're not willing to proudly uh, point to. Um, you know, it was Obama, I believe, who was the first person to ever address Planned Parenthood. And now it's Kamala Harris, who's the first, you know, VP to visit an abortion clinic. Uh, it's absolutely reprehensible. And, you know, what they've done with this abortion issue, too, it's just, <clears throat> I mean, the bamboozling of women, certainly, into believing that this is some kind of sacred right, as if they're all Mother Mary, and the only way you can get pregnant is, you know, immaculate conception. And look, I mean, I'm somebody that's very um, strongly pro-life. I'm also a realist. And, you know, I, I, what I, I mean, I like the idea that, you know, overturning Roe v. Wade, that left the decision up to the states. So states individually yeah. get to determine if they want, you know, infanticide or if they want to ban it outright. 
<laughs> but this has been bitched to this issue where the people that are really fighting for goodness and good, uh, they're being labeled as like enemies of women. And the same people that are fighting for abortion on the Democrat Party, you know, these are the same people that are, are that are arguing that men should be able to compete with women in sports. And they're the real ones that are assaulting women. Um, and it's just amazing to me, though, that this is that issue. I mean, people cannot think clearly, and I'm sorry to say, especially women, um, on this issue. I mean, they're so upset about the abortion thing. And look, I know it, I have plenty of people in my life, actually. Uh, I know people who've had abortions, and um, I don't hate these people. That, that's not my point. My, my issue with the abortion thing is that if we're going to have any kind of abortion in this country, it should not be looked at as something that's amazing. It should be, you know, something that, that, that we do very, very reluctantly. Last resort. Uh, we, we shouldn't be yeah. praising it, you know? And that's mm-hmm. the issue. We're celebrating abortion. That's not something that should ever be celebrated, you know? I mean, I get, I get why people have abortions. I get why all that happens. But it shouldn't be something that's viewed as a celebration. It's not. And that's what's so sick about where the issue has gone today. Yeah, very. Well, I I wanted to ask you about Don Lemon trying to fleece uh, Elon Musk, and he wants a Tesla Cybertruck, and he wanted $8 million, and he wanted $5 million up front, and he he wanted a private jet to Vegas so he could get massages and be in a hotel. So I'm like, oh, my God, I'll do it for free, Elon. Call me. Call me. I mean... Don Lemon is not a talent. <laughs> no, he's um, not. He's an SOB. Totally. <laughs> I, I, I just don't understand. Like, think about the arrogance of these types of people <laughs> that make demands like this, that think they are princes in America. Don Lemon's a loser who got caught, you know, groping some dude in a bar. Um, you know, <laughs> it's just r- disgusting. Like, this guy, we're supposed to be cheering for uh, Don Lemon, according to Don. Well, I don't think so, man. You're a loser. I can't believe these people well, are rich and get paid and he ever was even on CNN. I mean, these guys, they don't he, have to He was always a jerk. Together. He was always a jerk because I would listen and watch CNN. He was on late at night, and he, he was just always a loser, I have to say. And and to, well, to try to, like, fleece Elon Musk of all the people. <laughs> well, he had – apparently he used to have the producer – well, the owner even, but he used to have Jeff Zucker in his ear. So you know, you have wear, you wear an earpiece, and the um, the back of house, if you will, you know, the the, the, the production side, they're communicating with you. Mm-hmm. And apparently, Zucker used to just tell him what to say. Oh my gosh, how how wimpy is that? Nobody needs to tell us what to say. So where and the biggest British story is where is Kate Middleton? And we've got the Photoshop Gate that has happened, um, and then so I started digging into it. And so that story was crazy, and so was the other one. Candace Owen came out, and I was shocked. She was supporting that macaroon, President Macaroon, I call him Macaroon of France. His wife is actually a trans man. And so I started Googling these things, and... And, like, it was scary because these were coming from legitimate news sources, Drew, that Macaroon's wife's a man, and there's been no pictures for the last 30 years, and that maybe Kate Middleton, uh, Princess Kate uh, Williams of Philander with, like, one of their friends has maybe caused all this. So, you know, I was like, well, maybe she got a facelift and needed more time. So what what are your thoughts as a young millennial since I'm just an Xer over here? (laughs) Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I saw the I saw a little bit of people upset about the Photoshop they got caught with and all that. I, I didn't know. <laughs> I hadn't studied it too much. I just I was concerned because she had an operation recently, and I was concerned maybe that you know there's a very serious health issue she's right, dealing with, right? And that and that and that maybe um, you know the cause of these absences and the photoshopped image and stuff is that they're 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 kind of hiding from the public, you know, kind of a severe um health issue that it's worse than, than anybody wants to acknowledge. I don't know mm-hmm. if that's true. I mean, I just I mean to me it was kind of the tabloid gossip and of course, you know, the royal family, you know, it's it's like a favorite pastime of everybody to, to to kind of speculate, especially overseas. And I just hope that everything's okay with them. I mean, look, 
they're kind of the only thing going for Great Britain in terms of the royal family because um, the other ones, Harry and 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 Meghan Markle, whatever her name is, you know, I mean, they they've disgraced the entire uh, nation. So I really uh, hope these people can live up to the expectations to some extent because they're not going to have a backup with Harry and Meghan. Right, the Netflix grifters. Everybody gets a Netflix deal, Drew. When are we getting ours, please? I know, I know. Well, you you got to come out hard dim as well, you know. <laughs> so so tell us about the show cuz literally I adore the first episode. I thought it was was fantastic. You rocked it. Um and then how the book America's Last Stand is doing as we wrap up. Yeah, well the the um yeah, the show, the it may change names, we'll see, but you know, it's a weekend show every Saturday it plays a couple times, you know. I think it, I think 9 a.m. is the first time it you know, uh, you know, the first live show or whatever. Anyway, um, you know, it's on Patriot TV, which is kind of the Michael Flynn, General Flynn backed uh, network. He's on the board there doing a lot to push it. So, yeah, it's an exciting opportunity. We'll see where it leads. Um, I mean, you know, I just I want to get in front of as many people as possible and do the same thing I'm doing here. And I do every day just trying to to, to enlighten people uh, and bring truth to <clears throat> to the situation. So yeah, that's exciting. So true. And then uh and then in the book, the the book kind of ebbs and flows, you know. I mean, it's been a little bit. It's been a uh, to be honest, just because you know I've been talking to you and your audience forever. It's kind of stagnant right now, I think, for the most part, which is a little bit disappointing to me, uh, just because you know it, it's the only book that addresses like, you know, this is uh, it, folks, twenty twenty four, and you know, make the case to vote for Trump over Biden, and you know, I mean, I'm you know, it's like. So I'm trying to get out there in front of people as, as much as I can because I really it's a, it's the book is more important now than it was when it first came out. Um, but, you know, you know how the world works. I mean, <clears throat> you kind of like it, 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 it's hard to keep getting out there about the book. Um, you know, there's so much competition and things like that. So it's OK. I mean, it's not a woe is me. I'm not a victim. The book's done done pretty well. And and people have read it and have had good feedback. But I just wish that. Um, I could find a way to kind of uh, make it front and center for people again, because uh, all these people that are out there that are really contemplating voting for Joe Biden over Trump, they need a copy of this book. And I think that it can do a lot to change minds and persuade hearts. uh, But, you know, people have to know about it and buy it. Well, it's wonderful, and we love talking to our favorite Millennial Minister of Truth, and we'll have you back, Drew. Always wonderful, and I hope you feel better. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for dealing with my occasional coughing. (laughs) We'll be right back on Veronica Live.